all truth stemming from God's word means that you can come back and figure out what is truth because the world's going to tell you a lot of other things and you can come back and check. Well, let me see if I, if my foundation of truth is based on God's word, then I can come back and figure out what he said. Well, hello there. I'm Greg. I'm Tanya. And you got that right. And this is Ask Mom and Dad. We are a podcast where Tanya and I sit together and discuss all things related to family and life as we see its relevance today. It is brought to you by Sawyer Clan, a subsidiary of Random Discussion Productions. I know that it sounds like I read that because I did. We believe that (laughs) talking together about things that matter in life will go a long way in sustaining a healthy marriage and raising our children in a healthy way. Because we do want all of our children to grow up to be responsible, healthy adults. We loved our kids as best we knew how, and we pray that we damage them in the least amount possible. <laughs> um, though I'm not, I just, my kids, I don't want them to think I'm a liar. I know some of them are damaged because of us. So, <laughs> well, in spite um, we of are us human. Too. We do have a sin nature, just like everyone. So, however, we just like believe. we talked about this last time, we pray that we are in submission to the God who can make um, our mistakes into good. That's what yeah, Romans do. 8, 28 you will not <laughs> find, Yeah, you will not find that we are those who believe that we have ourselves at the center Listen of the universe. We just act like it now and again. Yeah, yeah that's true. And that's why we have people in our lives to conk us on the head. To, oh, to, that's sometimes nice. an adult conk needs the, the what was it we talked about, the rod of discipline in their yeah. own lives, you know. I used to say to my friends, I said, listen, look, it's real simple. If you want to get my attention, just hit me in the head with a two by four G- <laughs> gently and I'll pay attention. Anyway, you can find us online at SawyerClan.org. If you would like to um, submit a question for us to consider to talk about, you can go to that particular website, SawyerClan.org forward slash ask. Or you, if you go to SawyerClan.org in the upper right hand corner, you will see a button you can push that will take us right to where we are. And you can see a form there where you can submit that for us to consider Last couple of episodes, we've been talking about head shaking. What are you thinking over there, Tanya? I, I oh, can't, I'm uh, trying to find the stuff I had up here. It's all gone. You <laughs> I can't it. find any of it. And <laughs> also, if you want to know what SawyerClan.org is about, it's about one technicolo- technologically challenged individual and apparently one vocabulary challenged individual <laughs> trying to have a conversation in a podcast. Yes, we're a great balance. Yeah, we? we really are. Last time we talked about um, how do we um, train our kids. What was the name of that episode? Um, how do we... Well, it was about discipline. Oh, discipline. About? That's right. How do we discipline okay. our kids? I, you know, it's it was so long. It was a week ago. Yeah. I mean, two days <laughs> ago, whatever it was. <laughs> How many days ago. these podcasts are apart? Um, so anyway, we talked about um, shaping uh, immature creatures into mature creatures. And one of the things you, we didn't mention, and I, I do think it's important to bring it up because you did, Tanya, was um, when we were talking, was that we, um, we didn't mention the fact that we chose to... Um, homeschool slash not homeschool our kids <laughs> just watching you across the room and i have no idea what you're I'm reacting to it's like did something blow up on you? i look for is gone everything i looked up that's okay we'll jaw going. dropping moments i'm looking at yeah, my wife I'm and just, just drop if you could just picture her mouth just dropping and i'm like <laughs> what did you see is somebody shooting you pop up that you don't want on your no, screen no it's just interesting because the the articles i looked up about where our public school system came from they're all gone like i can't find <laughs> I'm thinking, the, the okay, I wonder who, yeah, who stole those out from under me? But anyway, whatever. Go ahead. That I'll was what you were going to say. Was, the government. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, right. <laughs> oh, well. You were going to say, Blake is my, we didn't really my talk engineer, about. My engineer is, is editing me. I'm not so sure what to do about that. <clears throat> okay, I, I trust in all things, Blake. Moving on. You were saying. No, you were saying something about how we really didn't. You said you wanted to revisit um, about homeschooling because we didn't. Really yeah, we didn't talk much about homeschooling. We because t- we talked a couple of weeks back about um, or last two episodes ago about uh, how our country kind of went haywire. Yeah, and one of the on one of the things that we made a decision when we were younger, um, we had our first kid, the perfect child. He thinks um, actually, no, we made the decision before we had children at all. We decided. To homeschool. I believed wholeheartedly that you and I were going into the ministry. So time with our children was going to be limited because we'll be giving our lives away. I mean, that's what I knew. And um, yeah, I had just committed my life to that since I was yeah. 10 years old. So 
when we talked about, you know, if ever children came, which at first I didn't want children at all, you know, all that kind of weirdness because pain and stuff. But (laughs) but when we started talking about having children and having to be in the home and be with us. Go ahead. The pain and touch comment. I'm just now processing that joke. (laughs) I'm a girl. Yeah, you know, no, I had to I, think of all I that part of it, not just, oh, children uh, appear in the I just home. read in the Bible that <laughs> sons are heritage from the Lord, blessing, all that yeah, kind of exactly. stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, and it kind of leaves going, out that if you find a woman who's willing to go through that. <laughs> I just would encourage our reader, our listeners to go back to Genesis chapter 3 and see how that falls out. So, <laughs> go ahead. Anyway, I when we entertain the thought of children at all, I don't, I didn't want to not have the influence over their lives. Submitting them into a place of... Um, whatever, even if the greatest teachers in the world, we talked about this, no one loves your children more than you do. Yeah. No one knows better for your children than you do. And God gave them to you. He didn't give them to this uh, random teacher over here or this, even this great, wonderful person at your church. He gave them to you. And right. that there was a reason in that. And I believe it's to grow us up as much as anything. But one of the things that really held heavy on my heart was the time with them. And I knew that in the ministry our time would be divided because we would have other people in our lives demanding our time. So if we also sent our children out eight hours a day out of the home to be, quote, taught, that that limits so much the time that you have with them. And in the evening time, if you have anything that's church-related or anything that's ministry, you know, if you literally, if you even just have to go sit by the bedside of someone that's sick, you don't get that time with your children. So I felt very strongly, of course, here's another angle on me that is different than some people out there. So my mom teases me because when I was really little, I played school at home. (laughs) I would literally, you know, put my dolls up in a a row here and teach them. I don't know what I taught them, but somehow I liked writing on the chalkboard and I love books and, you know, all that kind of thing. I really wasn't that great of a reader, even though by about third grade, I had found like boxcar children books that I loved and kind of absorbed, but I wasn't a a consumer of reading, but I did love the idea of information, I guess, or of, I was curious about, um, I liked the idea of teaching, I guess. I, I don't really see myself even as that great of a teacher, but I did, um, and still do love to consume knowledge. I love, now I love history. I couldn't quite get it, you know, back then, even the dates and stuff never made any sense. I believe, though, that's a little bit of a failure of the type of education I had. Um, We've been since, you know, as as a homeschooler learned how to school kids according to what their bents are and according to what they how you can get their minds active and um, engaged. It's a little bit different than the way I was was taught. Anyway, all that to say, I was always interested in trying to teach. But more than that, I really, really believe that it's. God's word that I want to instill in my kids' minds. I don't really care about anything else. Of course, I wanted them to learn to read to so they could read the Bible. Right. Of course, I wanted them to know how to be literate in our society and not be able to, or, you know, to be able to interact. But nothing is Im- as important to me because I knew that nothing was as satisfying as taking care of every need I had for me. And when I was five years old and and trusted in Jesus and knew that he loved me beyond everything else, that's all I need. And I believe the Bible says that. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's probably, um, you know, of course, that's what my parents taught me. They got it across, though, with me being in public school. Well, and I think it's so they did manage to get across. And we're going to come back to that. But that's what we're going to. We talked about last time a little bit about the importance of taking responsibility in that. Discipline is proactive, not reactive. And, and when it comes to, to what you're saying here, there, there's a, the most important thing to you was establishment of character in our home. In other words, our kids understood um, what was most important was their character, their relationship with Christ, which is the foundation of character. Well, and yeah, that the foundation the, of truth. Right, is foundation of truth say. in the Bible yeah. is that. So, character it, definitely and, and I, but and I reiterate that piece of it only to, in, for the purpose of saying this. We have lots of well-educated fools in this world. You can have knowledge <laughs> yeah. and not have character, and the result of that is corruption over and over and over again. Well, or and I we would also refer to, say, to it as Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, I would venture to say you can have knowledge without truth, 
and you can have knowledge without any wisdom to apply whatever good knowledge is out there. God is the beginning. This is where our homeschool was based on Proverbs 2, 6, which says um, the fear of God is the beginning of all knowledge and wisdom. So my understanding of teaching children from that perspective was that they'll have access to everything they need if they know him. Right, right. So it's it starts, completely different. It, everything than, is Everything depends on the foundation you build it on. Yeah. And so when we think about that, we... We have a country that you know has got a. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say nationalized. That's not the word, but as, that has a public school system, a system that's Broken, provided yeah, and, and funded by the government, and most of us have come up in that. And right. we chose to, to I want to say that we homeschooled. We chose to homeschool, but we didn't totally do that entirely. We made decisions as we went along. This is what right. I would refer to as proactive parenting, you know, or being intentional. Right. We did not just say, "Well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to isolate all of our children." Some of our kids make fun of some <laughs> homeschool kids, and I think Judah makes some of fun of, fun of some of his friends at school that are a little overly homeschooled, or as he put it, <laughs> a little too homeschooled for my taste. <laughs> I think it's more that sheltered or whatever. But yeah, the the idea that we didn't keep them separated out of culture completely, and we no, gave it was them important. It was important choices to me. as they yeah. got into high school. So. Um, Six out of seven of ours went to high school, and or seven out of eight of ours, actually, I guess. Well, kind of. Catherine actually came back from there and, and then went back again. <laughs> but um, right. it was a definitely a combination of we wanted them to be ready. That's what I feel We like. wanted to teach our children how to think, not what to think. There you go. And, I mean, we taught them first when they were young. We taught them what to think. Let's not, <laughs> let me be real fair. We, th- when they were f- between one, uh, born and at ten – uh, here's what you're supposed to think about that. But when they become teenagers, they begin to have this this pushback, this questioning. With puberty comes questions. Well, and I so mean, we began to teach them, and, and we did this beforehand. But they had, so they had some tools when they hit puberty. But nonetheless, again, it was to me, thing that the foundation of where truth comes from, and that is in our home, it's God. Right. And all all truth stemming from God's word means that you can come back and figure out what is true. Because right. the world's going to tell you a lot of other things, and you can come back and check. Well, let me see if I if my foundation of truth is based on God's word, then I can come back and figure out what He said when so and so tells me otherwise or whatever. So that yes, that's that was the point of early childhood to me was that I wanted all the curriculum from our home to come from God's word first out into English and math and science and whatever, rather than. Um, what I guess I kind of learned, which was to go and learn English and math and science, and you come back and you look at God's Word, and then you try to kind of reconcile that. I didn't want them to have that thought at all. I wanted them to understand God's Word is first, and you measure everything else yeah. from that. The question is is not, so, does my you know does the Bible reconcile with what I'm being told at school? The question is what I'm being told at school reconcile with what the Bible says. Right, exactly. And the Bible is not anti-science um, right. and those kinds of <laughs> things. And we as theologians don't spend their time, uh, when I say theologians, Christians don't, should not spend their time de- the debating, <laughs> debating that question. Uh, just in case you're curious, there's still, even now, things are trying to punch in, right? Um, Christians shouldn't spend their time trying to figure out um, if the Bible reconciles with science, per se. The question that we should be asking right. ourselves is, how does science reconcile with the scriptures? And what I was going to say is Christians spend their time when a, when a new scientific fact is discovered, and I mean a real fact, you know, like gravity, for example. <laughs> when that first came out, let's do something that's not controversial. We know that when the, you shoot the Chinese balloon, it falls to the ground or to the ocean, <laughs> wherever you want to shoot it out. That wasn't, that wasn't a modern thing. Both Chinese balloons. Um, anyway, <clears throat> when you the, gravity, when that happened, there was controversy in the church because of just what was going on. But uh, at the time, and but now it's not even something we think about because what's happened is the theologians said, "Well, what is what did God create there? What went on?" And we started asking ourselves, you know, "Oh, this is there's laws of physics, and here's what they look like." And it's not in a conflict with Scripture. The thing we have to understand is Scripture is not trying to teach you about science. It does have science, and it does teach science um, at some levels. But its point is to teach you about God, who right. created the things that we're discovering along the way. Now, all of that to be said is nothing like we were going to really dig into this today, but to say, except for to say this, is that you and I made a decision along the way to involve our children in the public school system uh, for various reasons. As they got older and we had taught them, we felt we had given them the tools that they needed to, um, to be able to answer the questions that society was going to pose. And the best trial grounds that we had was we still kind of have some control and say over them when they go in the public school system. They can be involved in the, um, 
th- extracurricular extracurricular and activities and things like that. Well, to and some degree, so it's a little bit like we talked in the last thing about um, discipline and how, and as they get older, you talk through things with them. Yeah. One of the things we wanted them to be able to do was to start to choose. The problem is you can't let them do that too early because they do need to understand, like you said, what what the parameters of what we believe are. So if as you start to, though, let them apply the things you're teaching them, then you give them choices. And, and the, one of them was, yeah, if they wanted to go into – um, some of the school system opportunities, such as Noah wanted to play football, so we wanted to let him do some extracurricular, and uh, obviously we couldn't offer football at our house or even with some of the homeschool groups we were in. So that was one of the um, options he had. We also had a, um, at least one child who we knew was kind of a natural leader, and to put her into this situation and to, like you just said, challenge, I think, to see, um, help her, put maybe put to use some of the things she had learned, um, it was a scary and a little, and she even says now a little bit, um, she feels like it, it wasn't all as great as it was cracked up to be. There were some things about it that really did probably weren't as good as they could have been. Um, in other words, I don't know if now, if we would have given her that choice now, if she'd, you know, <laughs> she'd think, no, that wasn't really good for me. But I, yeah. I do think God wanted her in there because there were some people that she was able to influence. Yeah, there be, was definitely. Including right. her own teacher who literally probably came to Christ because of her and her um and cap and their influence and in Absolutely. Life. And I, anyway. So so let's let's move on to our notes. Yeah, that was yeah. They know you know who you yeah, are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we used to say that when we were discipline. One of you, know you, who you are. know who you are, right. but we're going to tease it out of you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh there's a there was a question that came to us or a comment that was passed on to us by another member of our family, a senior member of our family. Um about where well, something we mentioned a couple of episodes ago about uh, the beginning of the school debate and prayer and getting prayer out of the school or God out of the schools as it were, and it was it was brought to our attention about the Thomason letter Thomason Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist Convention where the whole concept of the wall or the iron uh, what that was my mom that was your mama yeah, yeah. I was trying to say that in the you know, <laughs> it was not that was sounded like anyway, was your she, mama. anyway she's the one that referenced how we actually first started to challenge the um, separation of church and state, and it right. was way back. They used this letter, even now in court decisions and Supreme Court. They right? they, they used it as a reference point in fifty some odd cases Which over the course of time. Kind of silly it's that, like yeah, that created a the debate, and it's the, it's not so much the letter itself as it was the uh, the phrase that comes from the letter to create a wall of separation between the church and state, and it's been it. It's been used in a way that is not the intention of the letter. So just in real brief brief overview, the letter itself was a letter written by Thomas Jefferson in response to the Danbury Baptist Convention in Danbury, Connecticut. The government of Connecticut was overwhelmingly represented by congregationalist religious, the denomination of congregationalists, and they were making trouble for Baptists. And so the Baptists wrote Jefferson to say, the um, the first the, the first amendment the, the clause of in the um, bill of rights bill of rights yeah in the amendment first amendment of the constitution excuse me did not clearly articulate the limits of this because they were getting this pressure and so he responded to them in order to um, to make that point let me let me just share you this paragraph it says believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his god that he owes account to no one other than other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with severe sovereign reverence that the act of the whole American people, which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or what we call the Establishment Clause, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. He had originally written the word eternal, but that was um, scratched out. According to this expression of the supreme will of the nation in behalf of the rights of conscience, I shall see with sincere satisfaction the progress of those sentiments which tend to restore to man all his natural rights, convinced he has no natural right in opposition to his social duty. So that building a wall of separation became a phrase that was misused. This was clearly not about saying, hey, you can't have prayer in schools or you can't have religious instructions in schools. This was saying that you cannot have a government entity impose upon 
a um, another entity the rights of uh, your belief systems. And, and so what happened here was the Congregationalists were trying to force this upon, uh, force something upon these Baptists, and they were concerned about it. And so Jefferson made that statement. Now that has been, so it was used over and over again in, in um, Supreme Court arguments. Now the Supreme Court argument that was important was the Engel versus Vitale discussion decision you said you brought up last time. Yeah, a couple of podcasts ago when we were talking about the... And, yeah, and if you're super interested and you want to, you can actually go back and hear those arguments on the web at a oyez.org. You can actually hear them actually discussing and having a conversation with the justices about it. It was interesting to kind of listen to that. But what happened was in that ruling, uh, there was a prayer that was being um, in the New York schools that had been had been instituted down from the uh, from the national um, super, uh, superintendent. And folks were arguing that that should, cannot be mandated. And they were. They, and what's funny is even in the argument, they say to the justices, we don't know that it is being mandated, it is being recommended. And so they don't want that pushed on anyone because it separates people out. So the justices ruled that you, know, you can't make that happen and struck it from that. And that just created a slew of opportunities. The next year, in 1960, excuse me, two years later, 1963, uh, there was a ruling, um, Abington versus Shep, where public schools can't sponsor Bible readings and recitations of the Lord's Prayer under the First Amendment's establishment cause. And then in the 80s, it just went crazy. There was three or four decisions in there. One of them was Stone versus Graham, where the court found the requirement that the Ten Commandments be posted, um, had no secular legislative purpose, and was plainly religious in nature, which was hilarious to me because I'm pretty sure it's posted right above the bench of the Supreme Court. Right. Let's go all the way back, too, because what I found was really interesting. Go ahead. Talking about... uh, Congregational government, what was it called? Con- What's the denomination? Con- Am I saying that right? The Congregationalist, yeah. Yeah, versus the um, whatever that Thomas Jefferson was ad- addressing. There was a Congregationalist named John Dewey and um, another guy who I don't know if they actually give his uh, affiliation, but Horace Mann, who, who are attributed with the public school system's beginnings and the um, the idea is, you know, when, we, when our country was first established in the late 1700s, um, pub, the public school system, as we know, it did not exist. Um, it was in, trusted to the hands of the parents, um, private schools, private instruction. Um, and we know, of course, a lot of the, uh, the training direct, um, losing the word, starts with an A, um, when they when they bring up, like George mentioned, when they um, work with someone else and learn a trade. Oh, apprenticeship. Apprentice. Yeah. <laughs> that was a big deal. So their their education might consist of learning to read and write in a private school of some setting, either at home or um, I think George Washington learned like in a boys' school. We read some of his early uh, boyhood stuff. And then they're sent by age of even even as early as 10 or 12 to apprentice with a trade. So they're learning, right. you know, how to be a member of society and learn how to learn how to read and interact and use math skills and such. But almost uh but even we even found out, and I forgot where I read that, that a big part of what was funded or recommended was the Bible as their first um textbook. So up to that point, there wasn't a question. Oh, to the point of the uh United States Congress publishing um, Bibles to be distributed into the schools for the purpose <laughs> of teaching children moral foundation. And yeah, so I wonder 18, what year um, that was. It was 1880, um, 81. Really? Like that, that was yeah. even later than I was thinking. So, um, No, 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 it wasn't 1880, excuse me. 1780 maybe? <laughs> it was in the early 18. It was It was yeah. short after, um, it was before the Civil War. I might be right, it was like 18, it was in the 1800s. 1800s okay, so. or probably earlier. In earlier the in the 1800s. Well. Yeah, it was. Because uh, the reason I'm saying that is there were also school teachers sent to some various places. I think it was places. under John Quincy Adams. I'm sorry, go ahead. Which would um, be much earlier. Well, that would have been our, I think he was the fifth president. Yeah, so that's about right. Anyway, um, they and we know that some at, you know, the one-room schoolhouse was big because, um, and McGuffey readers and such, which all had scripture throughout them. They were, it was highly, um, encouraged that kids would learn but that was because we knew that a a civil society should train their young ones how to take over the next generation basically okay so what i wanted to bring up was is though when we um when they started questioning this and i want to say it was around 1930 
this was when the Congregationalists were, um, and this man, and I'm saying he, they weren't involved as a denomination, but this man who started out Congregationally, Congregationalist ended up atheist. Because basically, like you started out with um, in our last broadcast, you, you have to decide, is it going to be God who's in charge? Or am I going to be a little G-God and decide that humans are good and at, at you know, whatever level that is, give um, accolades to humanity to be able to teach and, and, you know, bring up our own, quote, goodness. We know that um, Reformed theology says that men is depraved at the very beginning when we're, when we're born. So there's, there was this uh, argument back and forth. And these uh, denominations were kind of putting forth their theological basis is what I'm trying to say. Well, on that basis is what they started pushing for a, pub, a nationalized public school system. And it was literally to take God out of the teaching mm -hmm. in order to bring in humanistic um, teaching, literally for that purpose. There was some different quotes. I, I tried to look back up. That's what I was frustrated by. I've only got the ones that you put here. Alex Newman wrote a um, series of articles through the Illinois uh, Family Institute, and you, he published these in literally this month and last month. Um, there's a series going on, so you can look them up. And this is a quote from um, part of what I was reading, and I don't think I pulled out the other one. So anyway, one of the most far-reaching innovations to enter the schools under this Horace Mann was the, quote, whole word method of teaching, reading, as opposed to the phonics that had been used for thousands of years. It ended in total disaster. That story, which is crucial to understanding the modern illiteracy crisis, will be recounted up in, in another article. He's going to tell us about it. But after unleashing government education on the people of Massachusetts, which is where they were and where it first started, man went to Prussia. This, this man, his name, last name is man, sorry, went to Prussia to gain a deeper understanding of that regime's centralized indoctrination system. So they're literally going to Prussia to learn about how to educate children. Right. Um, they're calling it indoctrination. It's not a word we've made up in these last few, you know, conservatives yeah, no. are throwing that word out. Is a, is, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Well, I'm just saying that's what we're... It's used as a dirty word when it's in yeah. case of religion, but not when it's society. <laughs> Upon his return to the United States, he went back... Um, oh, he beat back conservative attackers upset about his schemes. Then he traveled the country like an evangelist, chilling for government schools, successfully promoting the Prussian system in state after state. The utopians believed government schools would make Prussia and other jurisdictions that implemented them into, um, into paradises of enlightenment and progress. The reality, unfortunately, has not been um, nearly so nice. In Prussia, the status educational system culminated into the total transformation of Germany into the most, one of the most despotic horror shows in human history. We know where that ended up. The idea of indoctrinating children into a line of thinking. Mm -hmm. That's what the public school systems were organized in this era from about 1930s to be. Right. They were literally, so all these different things that we just cited about um, that Engel versus Vitale and uh, Amidon versus Schmemp and some of the ones in the 80s uh, with Madeline Murray O'Hara. That's just a progression of thought. Those are to remove any evidence of of the of the influence of the truth of God's word and of of God as the source of authority like we've been talking about and to instead um make humans the authority and therefore talking our system into becoming you know what they believe we can do which is utopia which has never ever been ever successful in the history of humanity we know this and still Marxism and all that still takes over, still influences our thinking, still continues to somehow sway people. Oh, we can be good because we're good. I mean, ah! <laughs> anyway, we can see that some of that's why our nation has gone a little bit nutso lately, I think, because we've kind of come back towards um, believing that kind of thinking again. Somehow. Right. Well, the point of the matter, though, is that what you're getting at is that when you have a humanistic point of view, and that's what is in, is in pregnating the leadership of a public system, 
Right. And this goes back to the, the questions that the Supreme Court was not really addressing. I found it interesting to listen to the arguments of um, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I uh, don't know what I swallowed today, of the, of the case with Ingle versus Vitale. And as I was listening to that, I'm thinking to myself, I'm listening to lawyers and they're arguing a case and the way that they're arguing it is completely irrelevant to today. Um, it's a whole other structure. They didn't even use terms for religion that we use today. It was Mohammedism instead of Islam and yeah, stuff right. like that. And so the um, the thing that struck me was that you know when you have a, a completely different worldview, that that's what is succeeding in becoming the influence of your school system. And what was lost really at the Engel in the Engel case wasn't that um, what they were trying to argue was that we need to have the presence of our overarching values, which are rooted in Christianity. That, that was the, the point they were trying to make, and those values need to be reinforced in our children. Yeah. And they made it about a choice of belief system right. rather right. than an overarching American value. And, and I think that that was a battle, and the, the, the American values now are being questioned as to whether or not they're even rooted in any kind of Christian core. And while some of our founding fathers may very well have been deists, there wasn't a single founding father that didn't understand the importance of biblical literature to influencing the core values of what human beings um, needed in order to be civil in the world that we lived in, in the world that we live in, because every single um, one of them, whether they were Christian or not, wasn't relevant. They understood that what was in the Bible was good instruction. And basis for civilization. And basis for civilization, absolutely. Because God has given us the um, understanding of the best law in the land and, and the starting with he is our God and worthy of worship. But um, so I'm going to back up a little bit because that Horace man was after this man who was the Dewey, John Dewey that I talked about. He's the one that was the congregational um, guy. And it says, and he went toward social gospel, which is eventually became an atheist later in life. Dewey's views on philosophy and education flowed from his naturalistic worldview. He replaced Christianity with a religion of his own, secular humanism, which he described, um, uh, though, I'm sorry, is described in a common faith. Here's what it is. Here are all the elements for a religious faith that shall not be confined to sect, class, or race. Such a faith has always been the common faith of mankind. It remains for us to make it explicit and militant. So Ooh. he's, yeah, so it's a really subtle, the problem with that is it's a subtle enough that Christians bought into it too, probably. Dewey rejected God and his word as central to education and replaced them with secular humanism. Democracy was Dewey's God, little g God, and the state school, his church. He thus taught that education centered on the child instead of God. The child becomes the son about which the appliances of education revolve. He's the center about which they are organized. That's a quote from... So the uh, child is the center of all things. School and society. Yeah, exactly. So That's John Dewey should not be held in high of what we, The yeah. antith- antithesis of what we said yes, last time. The whole point is that if that's, yeah, if we're basing educating a child on that child, what are we teaching them? Yeah, the, the right? education is about the society, not for child. You're training your children to be functional within the society in which they're going to live in. You're not training the child to be an unguided intimate. <laughs> well, and, and like he, it was said, uh, rather than on God, we're training the child to worship God, to, to acknowledge that God is the reason they exist and all of, of humanity. Because if they don't acknowledge that, they're not going to work for a civil society. They're not going to care about anybody but themselves. Right. That's what's going on in our world today. That's what I'm saying. Now, all the way back to I want we wanted to point out some of these things because I want pa- parents to understand that the public school system is not about teaching their child anything. Yeah, it's that's important going to understand. To bring up, yeah, especially it's going to indoct- going to teach them about Jesus and and his love for them and the best for them. However, does not mean and I know that there are so many parents out there that are number one stressed out because they do have to send their kids to school or don't know how, and I think some can make some sacrifices and come bring them home. I think there are ways to do that. I think we've talked about how you can find other families even that would cooperate with you. I've, I've dreamed up a way to help parents find another parent or another home family that they could trade off educating. And, you know, that way, if both parents have to work, then they could um, 
uh, share responsibilities. But there are many, a bunch of different ways to work with your child being in the school. Number one, you should be as close as you can to whatever they're doing, wherever they are. So if they're in a public school system, be there as often as you can. Get to know their teacher so well that when they see you, they, you know, roll their eyes or something because <laughs> you're you're there on top of everything because that's accountability. Number two, it, the fact that they are there means you've got, you've got a lot of prayer to do. You've got praying over their school and their influences. Obviously, even just legitimately their own safety these days is in, in jeopardy. So lots of prayer, lots of um, guarding them and their teachers and the curriculum and all that. But, but be on top of all of it. We've learned in this pandemic stuff, you don't necessarily even know what your children are being taught. Know what they're being taught. You need to know. Yeah, well, we found out. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, some of the other things we thought about is always be, obviously have them in church, have them in training sessions at church, have them in, if you've got Awanas programs, those are awesome because they're teaching them the Bible and memorization. Have them, to me, Never let them leave the house in the morning without at least showering them with some scripture or some, you know, praying with them, um, praying with them on the way to school. Pray, just And there are many parents who do this really well out there. I've met very many parents who are um, able to combat what's going on in their children's lives. And you can see many of them being attacked by our government these days for being involved, too well, involved. Well, okay, even. and let's back up on that. Um, it's important to understand that when we when we were growing up, going to school was dangerous to some degree because our, there was a competition of thoughts, and we would go home and we wouldn't be sure whether to trust our parents or not if our parents believed certain things. Right, right. Now we're not only being told that our kids, and we talked about this a couple of episodes ago, we're not only being told that our kids, um, our, our kids are going to school and questioning thoughts. We're being told we don't have the right to ask the questions about what they're being taught. Right, they can hide it from us legally. But know your, you need to know your rights, your constitutional rights are that you, well, first of all, you are their parents. Yeah, and they're Do using, not ever doubt that. And the system that exists today uses the fact that they have more money to pay for lawyers than you do to make sure that you keep down and, and you know, don't fight the fight. Uh, yeah, so anyway, to, to point this out, when you're sending your kids to school, you need to do these things. You need to ask these questions. You need to be involved in their lives. And I want to underline something we said last week about, um, last time, about discipline uh, you you may choose to release your kids totally into the school system, but understand it's going to be harder for you. You're going to do more work if you're going to out, um, s- work hard to Trust. help influence <laughs> their blah, words, um, help influence the thoughts of those children. If you're going to counter those thoughts. If you're going to have someone <laughs> constantly countering them. Yeah. Now, we did put our kids in school and at some point, um, but we gave them tools before we let them loose. We didn't put them in at five. We don't need to put your, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not a big proponent of preschool. I think that's just something we created in order that pa- people who want to work more than they want to raise kids. Well, um, and if you feel work. like Maybe they that's, need that's the socialist, controversial, but I, I mean, feel socialism, way, but. socialist. If you're feeling the pressure to, you know, have some people, kids for them to play with, that's fine. Put them in for one hour here or there or, or have, um, uh, you know, other families that they can play with. But, and if you feel the need for pre- preschool, just really limit it and, and be on top of what they're doing even there. Do not, the bottom line is, do not trust as much as we used to trust. And parents in, I think, in smaller, I grew up in a small town and we were, I was talking to my daughter a little bit earlier. Small towns tend to trust because they believe that everyone around them is for, for the same goals. But that's not true. And there's very few out there with the same goals and no one loves your child like you do. And no one can train your child like you do, like we just said. So, be aware always of what they're being taught and what they're, uh, what the parameters of what they're learning yeah, I, in all settings. Everything and in we're all talking ages. about here when it comes to public schools, the first thing that comes to my mind is to ask the question: Are you still want to put your kid in a public school? <laughs> I mean, after you know, so there are other alternatives. There's sometimes private, there's it, yeah, private schools you don't that, like you have a choice. that have well, been, and single parent homes. It's, it's a difficult thing, but there well, are ways. There are ways. I believe that God. Um, I believe you can pray and ask God to open those doors too. Because if you're feeling convicted that you want them to either come home or to be in a private school setting or something that you know is a little bit more um, with boundaries that you appreciate and believe in, there are ways. God will open those doors for you. I believe. Well, let's 100%. be creative, America. Let's think about this for a second, America. All, <laughs> all three of my listeners. Um, the uh, let's think about it this way. Can't we be more creative and think about school? People people think we have three choices. We have homeschool. Now that's the third choice. The, the, when I say third choice, it's the way 
this more recent that it's come to reaffect because it used to exist a long time ago. Yeah. You know, my, um, my 94 year old uh, stepfather, he went to a one room schoolhouse and it was all grades. And when they integrated to the public school and all of a sudden there was different grades, he was, he, he failed, he stopped learning. He dropped out of school cause he couldn't adjust. Hmm. So public yeah. school I'm literally killed his education too. at that point. He did better in a school, in a pub, in one room sure. schoolhouse with a small group of people and this large group of people that made fun of him for being taller than everyone else in class. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, so there's, we got the public school, we have private school, but now people, private school's too, in, too expensive. I can't afford it. So here's what I would say to that. First off, tell your church about it. If you were out there trying to go into a private school situation and you don't have the money or you're in a single parent or something like that, you're, the churches, yeah. let me say this to two people, churches, and I would <laughs> say this to the parents. First, ch- parents ask about help. Secondly, ask, for, ask the school, because they sometimes there's benefactors and scholarships for those, and ask your church. Um, secondly, churches, think more creative. Churches and homeschoolers, to you I would say this, um, why can't we come up with a way to involve parents who are single parents, because you mentioned single parents, um, and others so that their children can be homeschooled while mom has to work. We can help right. take other children under our wings and school them. That's that's what a community does together. And make the make the public school obsa flip and leet. <laughs> make them beg for us to come make back. Make them go, please come play our <laughs> sports. Our, our football team is losing. <laughs> um, you know, something. Give them an opportunity to make, to question the choices we can take. And then the other thing you can do when it comes to get involved, I didn't get into this. We're talking about our kids directly, but, um, and I realize I'm running a little long for what I wanted to on this, but I want to add to that. Get on your school board, run for school board. Um, if you want to have an opinion, uh, yeah. beat the person off the school board who has a dumb opinion. Uh, we're seeing that happen though. I mean, an entire governorship was rooted on how school boards were making stupid decisions and Virginia flipped the entire governorship because parents yeah. got involved. Right. That's right. And you just go make well, your and voice we heard. We recently heard really good story too about um, a fellowship of Christian athletes and some parents that went and heard their daughter's testimony and that um, group of hundred kids or whatever. So there are good things that are going on. It's yeah. just the thing Get is. Get your kids involved in groups that yeah, support do, faith. Do that even more and challenge the system. That's what we would really love to see happen. That that God could be introduced back into um so that obviously our children can start with him rather than have to consider his opinion later. Right. Anyway. I think that's that's super good. And um if you're curious about education, we educated our children pretty well at that sure if you hear, if you could hear chirping in the background and our engineer wasn't so extremely good that he edited it out, but my um, youngest son just told me that he and my son-in-law just changed the um, yeah, starter on the car. And so there, car. he's feeling pretty boss. And he learned that thanks to another <laughs> education thing, which is out there called social YouTube. <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Now let me say something about YouTube. That's a whole <laughs> yeah. another education conversation. So let's That's not right. say anything about that. The last thing I want to say, and we'll wrap it up with this today, is um, you know I've said something said about being in a church, partnering with um, other parents, coming up with creative new ways to get involved, getting involved in the public school system straight at the level of we. Um, I want to say volunteering. I'm not, so I'm going to say two things. Volunteering. I volunteered in the school system. I didn't go to PTA meetings. I did not want somebody telling me what to volunteer. <laughs> My daughter was in drama, and I was like, I can do sound, and so I did sound at drama, and I videotaped drama things, and I was there for set building. And those kids called me dad by the time it was over with. Yeah, I, right. I di- you can dictate the terms of your volunteerism. Yeah. If your kids are into sport, there are snack bars that need to be manned. Just you want to be where people are so your voice can be heard and your influence can be heard. You're going to find a lot of people out there agree with you on these things. I will also say we were in Washington State and there was a good system of an umbrella school that was funded by the public school, but the parents were there. They were on campus yep. all the time. So there are other options like that out there. Mount Montessori School, out. the whole deal. And that was free. And then last but most not least is let God show you how to do what you need to do and trust him to give you the strength to endure whatever choice you make. Yeah, that's right. Because he's the one that gives us that. We believe that, that, that's um, exactly right. that he is the one that gave us strength. People have to say, you have eight children? How did you do it? And I usually respond first with, well, my wife's tired. <laughs> um, and, um, and people would go, no, they don't say anything. They just kind of look no. at me like she does. But the reality is. No, it was such a joy. It day was definitely day. a struggle, and it was the biggest joy of our lives. So. Absolutely. I, I cannot begin to reiterate just how much of a joy it has been and continues to be yeah. to be the parents of wonderful children who are now largely, no, they are wonderful adults, <laughs> and one of which now knows how to change a starter exactly. in a car. 
And we are so grateful for that. We'll Listen, send all of our we want to thank you guys for listening. I want to talk a little bit next time maybe about process and enjoying the process. I don't know why, but we've talked about a lot of things we can't fix now. we got to fix over time. We're 35 years married. <laughs> Amen. Almost and with that being said, we will wrap this podcast up and thank Jesus that we get to live another day. I keep on.